Hi, I'm Steve McCord, Cattaraugus County Director of Veterans Services, and this is Our Veterans, Their Stories, Preserving Our Heroes' Stories, One Story at a Time. Uh, born and raised in Olean, New York. Um, I uh, left Olean in 1983. Um, I'm the son of an immigrant uh, from Lebanon. My mother was born in Lebanon, but married my father, uh, whose parents also uh, came to Olean from Lebanon in the late 1800s. Uh, my father was one of eight uh, boys, Simon family, here in Olean many of which were all uh, soldiers during World War II, served in World War II. Um, I always felt a, a sense of uh, commitment to the military and felt like I wanted to serve at some point, but I never knew when or where or how. Um, but uh, the day came, I joined the Army in 1988 um, and joined as a combat medic. I think it was 91 Alpha was the MOS. I know they've changed the MOSs. But uh, I joined in 1988. Uh, went to basic training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is the home of the artillery. I never understand why, uh, you know, I went there versus other, other places, but that's all good. Uh, went on to uh, advanced individual training in uh, Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I was one of 25 uh, soldiers that were part of a cohort group. They, they started these cohort uh, recruiting uh, programs where you all join the Army together, the same MOS, and you go through basic training together, AIT together, and on to your first duty station together. Um, so where did the Army decide to send me to see the world? Uh, Fort Drum, New York. So again, join, join the military to see the world, and, uh, and I got sent to Fort Drum. Uh, I got to Fort Drum probably January of, uh, of 89, I want to say, and I was one of two uh, when we got there. They, they said, well, welcome to Fort Drum, but you're not staying here. Uh, you're going to Griffiths Air Force Base, which is 70 miles south of Fort Drum. I was assigned to an aviation uh, brigade. So me and another one of my cohorts uh, took our duffel bags and jumped on a bus and went to uh, Griffiths Air Force Base down in Rome, New York. So that was, uh, that was a shock. We felt like, what are we missing out? Why are we, we want to be here at Fort Drum? But uh, the Army saw, hey, we need you here. So they activated the brigade, the aviation brigade. Um, there, was no, there weren't adequate facilities at, at Fort Drum at the time, the airfield, the capacity. So uh, the Army was borrowing some space from the Air Force down at Griffiths. Griffiths was a strategic air command uh, base, SAC base, B-52s, um, which was pretty interesting. Uh, but uh, so I was stationed there for uh, three years, and uh, that's where I made the decision to reclassify um, into uh, the counterintelligence field. I wanted to join as a counterintelligence uh, special agent, but at the time you weren't able to join from uh, you know a new accession into the army. You had to come in as some other MOS. And, uh, and, and reclassify at some point. So that's what I did. Uh, so in 1992, uh, I went to my reclassification MOS at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, the home of the Intel or, uh, Intelligence Center of Excellence for the U.S. Army, and uh, went through my training there. It was about four or five months long. And uh, where did the Army decide to send me after that? They said, hey, well, looks like you have some experience in light infantry, uh, 10th Mountain Division. We're gonna send you to 25th Infantry Division. And that was in Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. So me, my wife, and uh, three kids uh, and pet rabbit uh, got on a plane and flew to Hawaii uh, to report for my first duty station as a counterintelligence uh, agent. Uh, the day we landed, September 11th of 1992, and a hurricane uh, hit the island of, uh, well, it was supposed to hit Oahu. Thankfully, it didn't. It hit the island of Kauai. Um, and uh, that was our welcoming uh, to, to Hawaii. But it was a great three years there on the island. We got to do a lot of great things. Uh, assigned to the 25th ID was a great unit to be assigned to. After being uh, in Rome, New York, Griffiths Air Force Base, um, kind of much of the same, 
same environment we've been in our entire life. I married my high school sweetheart. Uh, so we're, we're from Western New York. Um, and, uh, so after going through the reclassification process into counterintelligence, um, we had, we had a couple of options. One of which was I go straight to Korea on a, on a company tour, or we can go to Hawaii. And that wasn't a hard decision. So it was not a hard sell. The kids were little, um, you know, my wife and I felt, man, this can be a great, a great opportunity. And naturally, uh, living in Hawaii for three years, you, you started seeing relatives you haven't heard from in a long time when they know you're in Hawaii and say, hey, we're going to come out and see you. Um, but it was great. We had, we, there was like a revolving door. We had, we lived on, on Schofield Barracks in Army Housing, uh, which interestingly enough, uh, 25 years later, we went back to, as a, for a reunion, all of the counterintelligence guys in our platoon. And we kind of went and retraced our steps and visited all of our, you know, where we used to live and, and see, say, man, how did I live here, uh, back then? But, uh, it was a good experience. I mean, the kids, the wife, beach holidays, family visiting all the time. Um, it was great. It was a great experience overall. But we, I do say, I gotta say, we did spend a lot of time uh, deploying to, you know, for training exercises and going to the field, uh, less, less, uh, less attractive part of the, uh, part of the assignment there is we, I spent a lot of time in the field uh, training and, you know, at, you're there to support the infantry. And, and that's, that's the, that's the uh, the mission uh, for for everybody in in the military is to support the infantry. That's why we all exist. That's why we're there. Um, so knowing that the wife and kids were enjoying themselves and having a good time, that was good enough. Uh, if if we were out in the field for thirty days at a time, or going to train up or going to JRTC, the Joint Readiness Training Center, in uh, at the time it was Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, before it moved to Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, it was it was all it was a very positive experience. No regrets. Uh, is a great great chapter um, there. Yeah. So training the infantry again. We were a nation at, at peace. There was no conflict at the time. Uh, again, this is after the Cold War, and we're always you know the mission of counterintelligence, like I said, is to prevent the adversary from collecting information that would be useful for their foreign intelligence mission of collecting on the military. What are their plans and intentions in the Pacific, for instance, in Hawaii? Um, so there were a lot of things we'd be doing that's kind of really fun things. Um, I can talk about this a little bit, you know, for example, doing doing inspections of the infantry brigade. So we had three three teams within our platoon of counterintelligence uh, uh, agents, and each team was dedicated support to a brigade, an infantry brigade. So your responsibility was to that brigade commander to make sure that you're doing everything that you can to, to make sure their their OPSEC is is tight, to make sure that the, if there's weaknesses in their their security procedures and practices, their overall security hygiene, making sure they're aware of what the adversary is capable of doing to collect against them. Um, little things from just imagine, you know, just imagine you're getting ready to deploy somewhere and the command uh, calls in, uh, you know, the, the unit, they get all their duffel bags, put them on pallets. People start talking about the deployment. People start talking, going to the, the shop at to buy uh, you know, things that they want to put in the rucksacks for the long plane ride somewhere. We would, we would, we would infiltrate the brigade, uh, our team, and kind of listen and learn and watch everybody's uh, mannerisms, what they're saying about the deployment, what they're, what they're talking about, going in and counting the number of duffel bags, uh, trying to infiltrate the headquarters uh, to get inside their planning meetings. Um, because at that time, you know, I think there was a kind of a lax mindset uh from what the adversary is capable of doing and you know we anything under the sun you gotta you gotta know that an, an adversary a sophisticated adversary like russia or china um now iran or uh, north korea they'll do whatever they can to get inside the wire and figure out what where are they going what's going you know what's going on there was a constant uh, cycle for Defense Readiness Brigade. Every brig every division had a readiness brigade in 18th Airborne Corps to make sure that if the balloon went up and you had to send forces somewhere within 18 hours, um, there was a brigade that was always on the on the ready. And that means they're all up to date on their their medical, their deployability. Uh, all their bags are packed, literally sitting and waiting for a call. So whatever brigade that was, the the CI team that the counterintelligence team that was dedicated to that brigade would be constantly um, 
trying to test their security, test their uh, their opsec, aw their awareness, uh, things of that nature. So the bottom line is you're there to you're there to support the infantry brigade commander to make sure you're protecting their critical elements of of information that an adversary would be trying to collect, which which is you know it's up to the imagination as long as you stay within legal, ethical, and moral uh, you know uh, procedures. Um, but a very interesting, our battalion commander, when I met with him, uh, when I got to, uh, to Schofield Barracks as a, as a young NCO, he said, Sergeant Simon, you need to remember one thing during your time here, and that is we're here to support the infantry, number one. And, and that's, at the end of the day, that's what we're here for. He said, I would rather be the blood that pumps through the veins of the infantry rather than to have the blood of the infantry on your hands. He said, remember that uh, as, as you spend your time here and everything you do is for the infantry. So that's something that stuck with me uh, through my entire career, both in, as a soldier and as a civil servant employee. And that that individual, uh, Lieutenant General Ron Burgess, ended up getting pr promoted to the three-star level, became the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, I followed him throughout his career, just kind of keeping tabs on him. He was an amazing leader. But that kind of resonated with me, that, 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 that phrase. And that saying, everywhere I went, um, and anybody that worked with me, alongside me, or for me, I said, we need to remember why we're here, and that is to support those eleven bravos. Those are those are the ones that are going up against the you know the grain. Uh, th that's why we exist. Um, at the end of the day, so there there was really the up to the wild. I mean, your wildest imagination of how you can support the infantry in in twenty fifth ID as a counterintelligence agent. We had very little investigative jurisdiction because there was an element that had that responsibility um, outside of the division. Um, but uh, whatever whatever we could do to help protect the the you know the information that adversaries would want to collect against uh, you know the division was what our, our responsibility was. Loose lips sink ships. Amen. I mean, I could have said that and been done in 15 seconds, but you couldn't be any more true. I mean, you go, you know, you get a, a, an alert. Uh, the, the Defense Readiness Brigade gets an alert and say, hey, we're, everybody meet in the quad. And the, the CI team would start just like going all over the base, all over the post and standing in line at the shop at listening to people talking about, yeah, we're going here, we're going there, or I got a this, or we got that, make sure you call this. And, you know, getting rosters of all the personnel on the, on the, on the DRB. Uh, Defense Readiness Brigade getting inside their S3, uh, learning about their plans and intentions and, and what, what's going on, what's the nature of the alert, where are we going, why are we going, um, just making sure everybody's uh, tight-lipped about what was, what was going on. We'd go in after duty hours and do an inspections of, the, uh, of the, brigade, the brigade headquarters to make sure people are securing information the way they should. Make sure there's no classified information laying out. Make sure everybody's got a good security hygiene, and uh, provide the brigade commander and their S2, uh, you know, feedback on, hey, you guys are doing well, or you guys are in the hurt locker. You need you need some you need some retraining, and also getting in front of a brigade a brigade of infantry during you know mandatory training day or week, and giving them the mandatory uh, at the time it was called subversion and espionage directed against the army. Sa Saida is the acronym. Uh, getting up in front of a, a, an auditorium, a theater full of soldiers, telling them why it's important. You need to be very uh, aware of the adversary's ability to collect against you, and and the honey pots and all the different things that they'll, the tactics that they'll use. Um, but it was a, it was a great it was a great three years there. Um, you know, professionally, personally, we were a platoon of uh, 22, 23 agents, uh, and we're all still friends to this day. We're all still in contact. We have our own little Facebook page. Um, we all went back to Hawaii uh, several years ago for a 25th uh, reunion, um, which is great. Um, that's that's one of the greatest aspects of my time in Hawaii is the relationships like brothers and sisters. Um, so did you, <clears throat> what, if, if your guy, if, if your division left, mm -hmm. you went with them because your job was to babysit them wherever they were and kind of trying to keep a keep a lid on them and keep an eye on them? That's correct. Right. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, we would, you know, when you go on to DRB status or DRF, Defense Readiness Force status, um, you know, my, my, my job as a team leader was to convince that brigade commander why he needed to give up three seats on the C-141 for three CI agents to be on that first chalk out, out the door or wherever they're going. 
and they didn't understand. It's your job to educate them on what counterintelligence does and how you keep that keep them alive. And and you know, telling them when you get to where you're going, if it's in a foreign nation, meeting up with the locals and meeting up with the embassy country team and making sure that the force protection measures are in place. Uh, so this is, mind you, this is in the 90s, um, late 90s. So this is after, you know, uh, the Marine barracks bombing. Uh, this is, you know, that's that's in the 80s, but still, it's it's still on the mind of everybody. I and mean, when you lose that many soldiers and Marines all, all at one one shot, keeping them, uh, you know, aware of how important it is that you're there uh, on the ground before troops start flowing in uh, on a mass scale and connecting with the right people, talking to the right people, making sure that you're looking out for the, the best interest and in, as people are arriving and where they're going and doing some uh, red teams and, and assessing uh, the, the force protection posture and helping. Because again, at the end of the day, the force protection mission is the commander's mission, not counterintelligence. But you provide counterintelligence support to the force protection mission, just like the medical corps, just like you know, every other, every other uh, mission that supports force protection. Counterintelligence these days uh, and, and I can get into that a little bit later, but uh, you're, you're dealing with a much more sophisticated uh, set of, of, of targets and adversaries, the technology. You know, you can't go anywhere now without a soldier kind of taking a selfie and, and shooting it to their Instagram, look at me, look where I'm at. So OPSEC, I think, is a, is a, a you know, thing of the past, and it's, it's, it's a huge concern, uh, in my opinion. got to Fort Meade in 1995 and uh, that's when things changed uh, like I said we started doing a lot I started doing a lot more real uh, counterintelligence work and for the the purpose of this interview I'm sure you can understand the need to to keep uh, keep that um, close hold but again the mission of, of counterintelligence for the US Army is to prevent our adversaries from gaining information about the US military whether it's plans intentions technology, research and technology, um, things of that nature. So when you say adversaries back in the, in the 90s, you know, talking about Russia, talking about China, um, you know, 9-11 had not happened yet. So we were kind of focused on what we call now nation state uh, intelligence agencies collecting against the U.S. Army. So uh, Fort Meade, 1995, that's when, that's when I started doing more focused real world uh, counterintelligence missions. Foreign intelligence, what does that mean? That means collecting on the adversary's intentions. What is the adversary doing? What does the adversary's technology look like? Um, because when the, you know, hits the fan, you got to know what the, the adversary's capabilities are. So that's, so you, you've heard of human intelligence, human that was the Army's human organization at the time, back in the uh, 1990s. And um, I supported them from a counterintelligence uh, perspective. How do you do that? Well, that's where I, I have to be f very careful in what I say, but making sure that the Army's foreign intelligence um, activities are not compromised, so to speak, making sure that making sure that everything the Army's foreign intelligence uh, activity at the time, everything they were doing was solid and was not, had no potential for compromise, that somebody else may have flipped something against us in a kind of a double sort of um, matter. Um, that's, that's kind of difficult to say. I mean, when talking about my, Did you plant people were, uh, were there, yeah, yeah that, that's difficult to say. That's, um, that's crossing a line that I, I really shouldn't at this point, but, uh, you can use your imagination. Uh, there, there's, there's some, there's some ways to make sure that, you know, in the course of learning what the adversary's capabilities are, um, that's a pure human intelligence mission, but from a counterintelligence perspective, my job was to prevent and to uh, you know make sure that those operations were were 100 percent solid and and not not compromised by the other other side so let's just say hypothetically if you were trying to learn what joe is doing in his secret room of building a widget that's going to change the market on 
whatever. Um, Joe may know that you're trying to collect something against him or something that he's working on. He may in turn, or Joe's boss may in turn say, you know what, we know that John's trying to pick up what Joe's doing. Let's let these little crumbs go his way. And those crumbs will send John on a different vector, totally different vector, and, and kind of manipulate your efforts to try to collect on what Joe's doing. It's, I'm trying to be very mindful of not saying what I, but you understand what I'm saying. There, there's a whole different, whole different set of things that, uh, that you know, the intelligence community is very, very good at. And uh, my job at the time was to make sure that whatever the Army's foreign intelligence activity uh, was doing was was sound and um, not compromised. The one thing I've learned <clears throat> from veterans, the the, the 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 tactic of look here, so I can do this. Right. <clears throat> yes. Very good. <clears throat> what were you, okay in the? This is middle nineties. Yes. What were you, what were you know, I'm, I'm trying to go back to like the technology that was available at the time. So what, what were the tools? Let's, let, let's ask you this. What were you monitoring? What did they have they were using for communications that you were monitoring? What, were, what, were, what was the technology in, at that era? So that's, that's completely outside the, the world that I was in. You're talking about monitoring, tech, monitoring technologies. That's more of the the sig signals intelligence and SIGINT and NSA, which is not which was not me. I mean, we barely had we barely had desktop computers at this point. Remember, uh, I remember operating on you know an IBM Selectrix typewriter uh, in the early '90s and not having a computer until like maybe '96 '97 on my desk, and that was a big deal. Um, and really, all that was for was just for communication, email communication, things of that nature. So, as far as technologies, um, that really that really didn't come into play uh, for for me in my role. It was more dealing with human beings and communication with human beings. So, so your your whole your your whole gig was I know a guy. I know a lot of guys. And yeah, kind of, it, it was more, a little more formal than I know a guy. It's, it's a very regimented process with process. I mean, leave it to the army. There's a process and there's a regulation for everything and staying in within the, within the lines. Um, yeah. And, and a lot of guys knowing a lot of guys. Okay. So how well did Am I going off track here? Yeah, it's sort of like the see something, say something, also training soldiers. Absolutely. I remember a lot of training telling us, and the example I gave you. Yeah. I saw something that I thought was bad. I called the right. counterintelligence, and they said, just observe and report and don't do anything and let us know. And the guy got deported. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for, for, for that, from, from that perspective, yes. So there, there is a very robust defensive program and and that is what army counterintelligence that's where you make your bread and butter and that is getting in front of the population of the army so think about soldiers civilians contractors family members overseas uh letting them know what the adversary is doing what they what they what and how they will try to collect that information and and making sure everybody is aware and, and get everybody on the same page and understanding what suspicious looks like. So again, to Joe's point, see something, say something, DHS and after 9-11, that became a very popular um, go-to phrase. But we were doing see something, say something, I mean, in counterintelligence decades before 9-11. It's just in a formalized army program and a security and education awareness training program. So. Imagine getting at, I, I don't remember what the size of the army was back then, but, uh, you know, when I left government, it was probably a, a million person organization. When you think about the soldiers, all compositions, you know, active duty, reserve, national guard, civil servants, contractors. I mean, it's a big organization. And how do you get all those people on the same page when, when, you know, they know what to report when something doesn't look right? That's that's you know you got every every person is is a sensor um, for the army when it when we know the adversary outnumbers us in so many different ways and they're leveraging 
capabilities and technologies and, and processes um, that they don't abide by any rules. They don't have uh, any concern about congressional oversight. So they throw everything in the, but the kitchen sink, uh, to include the kitchen sink thrown at you. You have to get you have to get your population aware of of what the adversary is doing, what they will do, uh, and, and and make sure they understand who to report it to. That's the that's the big key. Making sure they understand. Like in Joe's case, um, he he paid attention in that training, and something happened, and he reported it to the right people. And those right people in that case was counterintelligence. It may not be it may not be for counterintelligence to address. It may be something that falls under the jurisdiction of you know the FBI or another government agency. Um, but yeah, the, I would say the majority of, of good counterintelligence work is making your population, your covered population, aware of what they need to report, what suspicious looks like. Were you, that, which, you know, I was thinking that, okay, so, you know, who fed who? Did you feed the CIA or did the CIA feed you? Uh, no, the CIA, the CIA never fed anybody. <laughs> everybody, everybody fed the, no, that's just a little, a little tongue in cheek. Uh, um, it's gotten a lot better, but uh, it, the intel community, it's the intelligence community. When you look at it, you can Google this. There's, um, did I just say that? On, uh, yeah, Google it. Um, you know, the intelligence community, there's uh, eight, 17, 18 uh, partners now, members of the intel community continues to grow. I think Space Force just became uh, part of the intel community. So uh, technically, this, the intel community should be, in, in, should be sharing across uh, you know, wherever they find information that's of, of interest or would be of interest to the other members of the intel community, that's definitely a strength that the United States has that no other no other nation on earth has. Um, we we and it's gotten a lot better after 9/11 for a variety of reasons. But um, yeah, we there was information sharing back in the day, but not as good as it is now. Uh, well, I would say the Islamic, the Islamic nations or the Islamic groups have been on the radar for a long time. It's just a matter of when did, when did, when did it hurt bad enough for us to start providing more attention and, and more focus. And we all know there were a lot of, there were several different instances along the way that, you know, the United States got a black eye here, a black eye there. I mean, how many times you get hit in the face before you realize you're in a fight? Um, and, you know. Kobar Towers, uh, another another you know mass casualty event uh, in Saudi Arabia. The the USS Cole, as you mentioned, I think that was in 2000, year 2000. I'm actually I actually know some FBI agents that responded to that um, crime scene, and they described the 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 horror and just what they what they saw and just how devastating that was. The Marine barracks uh, bombing in Lebanon, I think, was in 82 or 83. Um, Either before or after the American embassy bombing in Lebanon, that was very personal for me because that's that's where you know that's where my family comes from. My mother was born there. Um, that's where my father's parents were born, um, and uh, that that was something that really motivated me in wanting to get in, get into this field. Was I, I want to prevent things from like that like that from happening again? Um, but it was it was always it was always an issue, uh, but it didn't become the issue until 9/11. And, you know, you really can't say Muslim countries because when you talk about Al Qaeda and the associated movements, they were stateless. They were not a part of a country, even though they may have had safe haven, safe haven or harbor or backing financially or turning a blind eye to it. Those were movements that hijacked, essentially, in my opinion, hijacked a religion. Um, and uh, so for, for me... Um, that all, that all, everything changed on 9-11. The priorities of the counterintelligence community and out of the counterintelligence community, the counterterrorism community was born because counterterrorism at the time uh, was a subset of counterintelligence because it was a foreign actor, a foreign group or a foreign nation that was um, behind a lot of terrorist uh, activity in the, in the 90s and then into 2000. What was it that launch this in your opinion yeah i mean in my opinion if you if you do the research you know a lot of people like to use the palestinian issue as the root cause for a lot of a lot of anti-us sentiment amongst groups in the middle east but i would i would love to sit down and to debate uh those groups because i think um it, it 
the whole Israeli-Palestinian issue, in my opinion, is just a vehicle, just a source for them to use as an excuse to hate the West, to hate. I mean, when you look at the most radical version of Islam, it does it doesn't comport well with the West. It doesn't. It doesn't. It just doesn't. It doesn't fit. It's not a. It's not a natural fit. And 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 we're viewed upon. I mean, our way of life is just viewed upon as is all things evil. Um, they have a view of a of a different world, and um, you know, it, there's so many groups to talk about. But I mean, talking about Al Qaeda springing up, we all know that was that was Osama bin Laden, and he had safe haven in in Saudi Arabia, and uh, and, and a lot of money, a lot of wealth, um, and and started the Saudis started put pressure on him, and then he decided, well, maybe I'll go over to Afghanistan, and, and that's kind of where the base of Al Qaeda was born, and and. The, the attacks on, on 9-11 were planned and orchestrated. The command and control was out of Afghanistan, from what we know. But, uh, you know, why? I don't know. I mean, why do extremists form their extremist opinions? You could, you could probably debate that for all different types of groups across, you know, throughout time. I mean, was Hitler an extremist? I would say, yeah. Um, did he have his true believer following? He sure did. Uh, like, so any other group, I mean, I, I don't know that we could point to any particular decision or period of time of why they said that's it we're at war with the united states and we're gonna we're gonna go at them until we you know convert the entire population of the united states into you know radical islam i don't i don't know that you can point to any particular time or, or occasion at least i can't at my my level of of knowledge and expertise so my my transition again from wearing a uniform uh what was in August of 1999, I made the decision to transition into the civil service. And uh, I was a part of a civilian uh, career program that was the Army's counterintelligence um, and human intelligence program. And uh, so I came in at the bottom of the bottom of the, the ladder, uh, GS9. And uh, it was it was not an easy transition. It was a significant uh, pay cut. Uh, you know, when you look at all the benefits you had as a soldier and the different the different um, entitlements, and it was it was a it was a hard pill to swallow financially. But I made the decision to do it, and uh, and it was it was okay. I'm not sorry that I did it. But uh, so I I did not move from one desk to another. I actually moved from one organization to another. Um, but the organization that I moved to um, had a very uh, interesting uh, mission. It was more of a, an offensive counterintelligence mission. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but where was I on 9-11? So I was up in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, my my, my uh, partner and I were up there to do some interviews at Fort Monmouth. We drove up the night before, and I remember we were staying in Red, Red Bank, uh, Red Bank, New Jersey. And um, it stormed like I've never seen it before. The, the rain, the thunder, the lightning, um, it was just like all hell broke loose. It was, I, I, I remember that day very, very vividly, the, the, the lightning and thunder and the rain. But the next morning, um, we drove up, I think it was a Monday, and a Tuesday was, uh, I think it was Tuesday, yeah. We drove up, and then the next morning, we were, we were getting ready in the hotel, uh, to drive over to Fort Monmouth, which was maybe 15, 20 minute drive. And as we were leaving the lobby, um, I heard I heard somebody say there was a plane that hit the World Trade Center. And I said, oh, wow, that's horrible. How horrible is that? You know, we get in the car and we're driving on driving, listen to the radio. And they said, yeah, a small a small plane, private plane crashed into the uh, Trade Center. Um, and I'm thinking, man, how horrible is that? Did the pilot have like a heart attack or um, and my, you know, my partner is driving with me. He's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's horrible. Um, and then we get to Fort Monmouth, we get uh, to the gate, we get checked in, um, and we get to the office that we're going to conduct the interviews in. And, uh, and needless to say, they were frantic. And, you know, we were, we were, we were guys coming in from Fort Meade and they knew who we were with and the organization we were with. And they're kind of like, oh boy, these guys, you know, it's kind of like, we we're kind of a it was kind of a big deal that we were coming to their office to to meet with them and and to plan something we were planning something pretty big and uh they were freaking out and i'm like what's wrong they said well plane hit the world trade center i said yeah I, I heard that's horrible they go i heard i said it was a small passenger plane they go no it was a huge airplane 
and uh, they had the TV on and we were watching and that's when the second plane hit the tower and that was like, oh my God, this is not, this is not an accident. I was like, how could a pilot, you know, if it was a medical emergency and how would you hit a building? Maybe, would you maybe divert and maybe, I don't know. So yeah, when we saw the second plane, we were like, this is, this is not an accident. This is really bad. So needs to say our, our plans for the day were changed and we uh, canceled our interviews. And then first thing I thought was, I need to call my wife. I tried to call my wife and we couldn't get a, a line. Uh, the, the phone lines were so jammed, you couldn't get a, couldn't get a, uh, couldn't get a, a, a signal. I had cell phones, we couldn't get a signal. Tried the landline, couldn't get, a, couldn't get out. So uh, I thought, hey, let me get on the internet. At the time we had Verizon and Verizon had a capability where you could send a text message uh, via something on, on their website. So I sent my wife a text message um, from the Verizon website to her cell phone just to let her know that, hey, because she knew I was up in the New York area, New Jersey area. Never told her exactly where, but I said, hey, I'm okay. Um, I'm on my way back home. But uh, so strangely enough, we, my partner Mark and I uh, said, yeah, we got to get back. So driving back uh, on, the, on the New Jersey Turnpike, imagine all the rest stops on the Turnpike. Um, you couldn't, we, there was no room for us to get off the Turnpike. Every rest stop was jam-packed with cars, I mean, off the ramp. I mean, there was literally no room to exit off the Turnpike. So we're, we're just pressing on and there's no traffic on the Turnpike, which was really eerie. Um, just very weird, but we, we ultimately made it back to Fort Meade and uh, we couldn't get back into our own building. Uh, they, they refused to let any, anybody in and you know, it's weird, but uh, we were just, we were told to go home. So we went home and waited for, for some instructions. Um, so we, we were at home for like two or three days waiting for uh, our command, our organization to get guidance on, on what to do and how we're going to do it. So that's, that's where I was on 9-11. And, uh, you know, from that point, you know, the, 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 the projects we were working on, my, my line of effort, everything we were working on was focused on, um, if you remember, um, if you've heard the name Win Ho Lee, uh, that was an individual out in one of the Department of Energy laboratories, Chinese national that was spying on behalf of China in the Department Department of Energy complex at one of the labs. And um, we, as counterintelligence, that was a huge wake up call. We got to we got to we got to get aggressive. We got to get after this. So our focus at that time, the counterintelligence community said we got to start focusing on on China and their their spying activities against the against the U.S. Um, but that all changed. Uh, that all changed in, in in one day, and we are now focused on them. Like, what's the Taliban? What, who's the Taliban? Where where are they at? Like everybody was kind of in a deficit in in knowledge about. I mean, yeah, we learned a little bit about you know in Afghanistan with the Russian invasion and the tactics and um, the Mujahideen and and what was going on there. But um, it was it was uh, we kind of caught got caught flat-footed if to, to sum it up we were flat-footed on on al-qaeda and um what what just happened so it took us some time to get kind of re-pivot uh from focusing on china russia iran north korea the big intelligence foreign intelligence threats to focusing on um you know you can't you can't make fun of them anymore you can't say that they were a bunch of uh just you know amateurs it, amateurs doing... definitely not amateurs this was a very sophisticated plot. When you look at it, you know, they came after the World Trade Center in 1993 and they thought they could take it down with a massive truck bomb in the basement. Well, they learned, they learned from that and they, they learned from that. They, they made some tactical errors. Uh, one of the individuals that rented the, the, the rental truck uh, that was the, used as the, the, the vehicle borne uh, uh, explosive device, uh, he actually went back to collect his uh, deposit. So that, you know, it, it's kind of amateur hour when you do something like that. But uh, yeah, they, they tried to take it down in 1993. They failed, um, and, uh, but they came back for it several years later. And I, I think, so in 1993, it was symbolic because it was the power of, of the United States, the, the financial power. I mean, when you look at those, those buildings, um, how can you not just like look at it and say, oh my God, what a, what a, what a, amazing what an amazing uh you know engineering uh 
accomplishment and just the, the symbol of, of New York City and, the, and those two buildings. And then that was in 93. And then don't forget, you know, the Pentagon in, in, on 9-11. Um, how many times I've been in and out of the Pentagon and, and specifically on that, the E-ring um, where, where the plane hit. That was, that was the Army corridor. That was, you know, that was, uh, you know, that's, that hit home as well. But um, just symbols of power. Symbols of power. I mean, the, we understand the Capitol was a build uh, a target as well, but is that what Flight ninety three was coming after? Uh, they, they say that's what it was, but it was all it was all coming after very you know symbolic uh, targets, and that's the nature of terrorism too, you know, sim hitting symbol symbolic targets to send a message. I think they were very sophisticated, and I think there was a huge over uh, underestimation of their capabilities and their collection, their intel collection capability. When you look at the the pre-attack surveillance, the pre-planning, the thought of, okay, we can't necessarily take a plane out, but how can we hijack the plane, take control of the plane, readdress, re, 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 uh, program, you know, autopilots, take planes off. These are 757s, they're not Cessnas. How do you take a plane off course to fly in California to turn around and come back and, and hit the X and, you know, on, 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 two or three different targets. That's not a lack of sophistication. That's those are very, very well thought, well planned out. And am I, you know, endorsing Al Qaeda and that? No, absolutely not. But I'm saying totally underestimated um, their capabilities. Totally. The planning, the again, the pre attack surveillance probably lasted for years, um, looking at the targets where, you know, what kind of security, whatever. Uh, for the for the planes, for the the thought of dry runs, uh, the hijackers riding those routes several times uh, before before 9/11, they became known to the flight attendants, perhaps, or familiar, so they're less of a threat. Maybe all of a sudden they see some strange guy sitting in first class. Um, it might, you know, after a while you get on the same route a few times, same scheduling. Those flight attendants may recognize you, you know, and say, "Oh, it's no big deal." But I I think I think. Uh, we got caught with, you know, flat-footed and, and totally underestimated the capability. Flying under the radar? Sure. Yeah, I would say, I would say, I can't, I mean, I can't speak for the intel community, but I'm sure there were great people, smart people in government intel agencies that were tracking, you know, uh, I almost said Saddam Hussein, uh, tracking Osama bin Laden, and there were small teams focused on Osama bin Laden. I understand that there was a chance to take bin Laden out with a drone program uh, over Afghanistan years before during the Clinton administration. That decision was not, um, they did not decide to launch, um, you know, the Predator drone program. That that was actually around uh, before 9-11. Uh, they actually had a chance to take him out, but the decision was made not to because they were concerned of um, casualties, you know, uh, surrounded uh, the targets. So, I mean, yeah, it's... Um, Hindsight's twenty twenty, you know, right? So after nine eleven, again being a part of that organization that I was assigned to on nine eleven, uh, I was there for another couple of years, and naturally, uh, you, you know, after nine eleven, we invaded Iraq, um, and after after invading Afghanistan, of, of course. But um, I I did not go to Afghanistan. Uh, I did go uh, to Iraq, though, and, and where my role took me in 2002, uh, in 2000, beginning of 2003, was in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq uh, in, in March of 2003. So I, I deployed to Qatar, um, the country of Qatar, which was um, much more underdeveloped than it is now. It's amazing what they've done over the last uh, several decades. but. Um, I was in Qatar and Kuwait in the lead up to the invasion and doing the things that I do for in my job and my my uh, the organization I was assigned to at the time. Um, I was based out of Qatar, but I spent a lot of time in Kuwait leading up to that uh, invasion, which was March of, of 2003. Strangely enough, um, you never know. It's a small world who you're going to run into and find out that you have a family member uh, also stationed uh, in Kuwait. And so I decided uh, that I wanted to see this individual uh, who's sitting in the room with us right now. And he's probably looking at me with lasers like, don't, don't say my name. But 
I'm going to say his name. So Joe Carey, uh, my cousin's uh, husband, he's my cousin, um, uh, was there in, in, uh, in Kuwait uh, with his unit getting ready to for the invasion. So um, he was living in pretty austere uh, conditions and not sleeping in a very, very comfortable uh, location. So I decided when I was in Kuwait, um, before the invasion, uh, I want to say it was so St. Joseph's Feast Day, is uh, before or after St. Patty's Day? I forget. Right after. Right after. So I said, "Hey, Joe, I'm here. I'm 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 coming in, and I'm gonna I'm gonna extricate you off the base." So I was staying downtown. I was living in hotels, driving Toyota Land Cruisers, and you know, showering every day. I'm not gonna say I didn't have it good. I had it pretty damn good. Um, but I came in. I met up with Joe, and uh, I, I snuck him off the base, and we went to lunch. I took him to lunch downtown Kuwait, and. Uh, and then we went to a nice pastry shop. It was St. Joseph's Feast Day, so we got some really good, uh, tasty treats and and snuck them back on the base. But that was uh, that was a uh, that was a highlight for me um, during my time there to see family. Just to, you know, here you are, uh, two patriots from the same family at the same location, and uh, knowing what's coming in a matter of hours. Because I think that was um, be- right before President Bush gave the ultimatum to uh, ultimatum to Saddam Hussein to leave the country. And we knew that was the trigger of when things were about to go high order. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was great to go to go see Joe and spend time with him before he pushed uh, up north. Um, but uh, yeah, that was uh, so I was I was there um, in 2003 and then my deployment was for six months. I came home and after I came home, I was like, OK, well, that was my that was my role in that that chapter. Um, and my assignments manager said, hey, I have a new opportunity for you, and I, I think you need to take this. This is something uh, you'll do very well at. And so they assigned me to the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force in Washington, D.C., and uh, I was the Army's representative there, um, and uh, I was the first first Army guy to, to show up. Because the Joint Terrorism Task Force was, was a program that has been around for a while, but it wasn't at the level it, it was now. I mean, it started in New York City, I think the first JTTF was in New York City, and then it's after 9-11, actually, every field division in the FBI set up a Joint Terrorism Task Force. And I got to say, you know, the, the government does things well. Sometimes they do things not so well. This is something they did extremely well, and the concept was, was tremendous. And that was you bring in all these different agencies um, who may not have known each other, who may not have liked each other, may not have understood each other their resources, their authorities, their capabilities, their strengths, their weaknesses, and you put them all in one big room, like a cube farm, and you're all there for the same goal and same uh, reason, and that is to prevent another 9-11 from happening. So, um, you know, we we all, so I, I showed up to the JTTF in September of 2003, and I stayed, I worked there for, th- for three years, um, which was a very, very, uh, um, it was a very rewarding experience for me that kind of set the tone for me for how I would view uh, my job and my role uh, as an agent um, and then leading into additional responsibilities, getting promoted up the chain and becoming the senior counterintelligence rep for the Army. Um, how to make sure we stay focused and grounded and, and, and keep our eye on, on what we're supposed to be focused on and less worried about bureaucracy and, and rice bowls and, you know, age old, uh, you know, strained relationships with people from different agencies, you know, the FBI, take it or leave them, you know, they, they are the nation's, you know, top law enforcement organization. And it was such a great opportunity to work with so many people uh, in that organization at, at, at the, lower levels. I mean, I worked with new agents, new FBI agents, brand new to the FBI back in 2003, who are now assistant directors for the FBI. They're senior leaders in the FBI. And the relationships that we developed and maintained over 20 years has just been very rewarding. And not just FBI, all the other, there were 30 different agencies on this task force that I was a part of. So what did we do on a day-to-day basis? We, we, We investigated suspicious uh, tips called in by the public or had investigations that we were working overseas, um, things of that nature, operating under the Patriot Act. And, and you know, the Patriot Act was, was very new. 
and increasing authorities for surveillance, uh, increasing mandating cooperation amongst U.S. government agencies, taking down the walls, sharing more information. You know, they 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 said share till it hurts, and then hurts, and then share some more. And uh, that's for me. I had no issue with sharing. It was other agencies. Um, I don't need to say who that didn't want to feel like they didn't want to share information with uh, people in a different. Why would you share intelligence with the U.S. Postal Police, Postal Inspector? Why would you do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe that person could affect some. It could get you some intelligence on an individual that you may be a subject of your investigation. Um, why would anybody want to share something with Army Counterintelligence? Well, because maybe just maybe one of your subjects is working in Iraq or Afghanistan and get ac get access to information that you might you might need um, in a war in a, in a you know area of operations in a theater. So um, three years, very, very positive uh, experience for me, uh, you know, conducting counterterrorism investigations and, and operations with the FBI. That was, a, that was a really great experience for me. Um, there, were, there were a lot of sleepless nights, but, um, but it, you know, not as bad. I, I mean, there's a lot of things that bothered, you know, bothered you that you, you see and still to this day you think about and but you, you have to, like anything else, try to, to block it out. But there, there were things that, um, you know, the American public would never know. And, and that's OK. It's good. It's good that they didn't know. Um, and uh, but there are things that they do need to know and that that, you know, people talk about. Uh, well, nowadays, you hear people say as well, it's a whole of nation approach or a whole of government approach on how we're going to fight, uh, you know, a war against China or a war against Russia or whatever. You have to get your citizens involved because every other every other adversary, their entire country is involved. Like, talk about China. Let's talk about China. So in 2017, China passed a national security law that every citizen of China is required to cooperate with their intelligence, uh, their intelligence uh, apparatus, the Ministry of State Security, MSS. Um, you're all in. You have to be, or your family member disappears, or you know something happens. Um, with with the United States uh, in in you know our fight against against our adversaries, there there's things that we need private citizens to be mindful of, and things that we need them to do. It can't fall just solely on the shoulders of of law enforcement, intelligence agencies. It's got to be a whole of nation uh, approach uh, when when you're up against uh, you know an overwhelming adversary. Um, the numbers just don't work. Um, but sleeping at night, yeah, I mean, good days, bad days. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it was it was an honor for me to, to serve in that, that type of uh, assignment. And then, you know, again, the relationships that you develop certainly helped throughout the rest of my career. Um, it, because when you need something, it's not Army counterintelligence calling the FBI, it's Joe calling Bobby. Or it's calling Joe, or Joe calling Sean, or um, you know, it's personal relationships. That's how things got done, because everybody, you know, we're all in the trenches together. You know, you'll go to the ends of the earth for each other. So, well, after those three years, where did you go then? Uh, where did I go then? Uh, I went back to uh, the organization I was with previously for about a year, uh, and then I got recruited to help come in and manage the program, the civilian program that I was a part of. So I was hiring new candidates, screening, selecting new candidates. Um, it was more of more of like an HR type job, but I saw it as an extremely um, rewarding opportunity for me to hire the gener next generation of, of agents uh, and, and, and army intelligence professionals, because how, you know, you're only going to be around for so long. You got to start thinking about who's going to replace me. Uh, in 10 years or 12 years or 15 years or 20 years. So I managed that program uh, for a couple of years, um, which was good because it was kind of a good decompression period because working on the JTTF, you could be at home at nine o'clock at night and you get a, a text message or a pay at the time we still had pagers and, um, and say, hey, there's a flight coming in from X country or it's, you know, we need you here right now. There's a suspicious something at location X and it's not, oh, well, I can't make it because, you know, I just sat down for dinner with my wife and kids. Everybody shows up 
that's a task force. That's that's a that's a team. Um, everybody does what they can to get to the X and help resolve the issue because nobody ever wanted. That was the difference with counterterrorism and counterintelligence. You could you could go home at the end of the day with a counterintelligence investigation and say, yeah, everything's okay. Nothing's going to go boom overnight. Lock it up. Lock up your stuff. Put all your paperwork away. Lock it up in the safe. You go home. With counterterrorism. Uh, you don't want to be the one holding that lead or the name of the individual and interviewing somebody that might end up doing something bad uh, and then waiting up, waking up the next day and find out, man, I should have, I should have done this or I should have done that. So everybody, you know, never again, never forget that for us, it was everybody stops what you're doing. You get out there and you go, you go help your teammates and you go accomplish whatever the mission is. So that was difficult for, from a personal level, a lot of time away from kids. Um, I spent a lot of time going, uh, it's funny how everything I was working on, um, on the Joint Terrorism Task Force actually had an overseas nexus, some overseas connection in Iraq, um, in Afghanistan, in, in the Middle East in general. So I found myself um, on planes a lot going back and forth with my FBI partners going doing some things um, in other countries in the world. and. Um, it was, a, it was a fast and furious three years, but uh, again, I'd do it all over again. But uh, it was it was uh, it was um, very rewarding, but um, you know, it took a lot. I was gonna say, what about the the weight on the shoulders? It had to be huge. It it was, but it, again, I mean, that's what you signed up to do. That's that's you picked your career. I mean, I picked my career. Nobody picked it for me. So um, you got to be passionate about that. You can't you can't go into it kind of yeah half step it. You know. Take it where see where it goes. You got to be all in because your adversaries are all in, and then some. And if you don't, you know, you're gonna end up, you know, reliving some bad memories. So.